Okay, here we go. Ding, 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 and a one, a two, a one, two. Welcome to the most recent podcast in our series, Beyond the Expected, The Coronavirus Effect. I'm your host, Michael Bernstein. I'm the interim president of Stony Brook University. Uh, during our most recent episodes of Beyond the Expected, we've been talking about the heroic efforts of many, many people here at Stony Brook in confronting the coronavirus pandemic, from mental health to physical health to economic impact to telemedicine and epidemiological solutions. We've been having an array of conversations with our experts and specialists in the field. Today, we'll explore what some of our colleagues are doing in the areas of sponsored research and how an evidence-based approach to addressing the COVID-19 symptoms is helping us to reduce morbidity and mortality in the patient population we serve. We'll also explore how personalized engineering-driven medicine will help lead the way toward better diagnosis and earlier intervention in this terrible disease. Let me introduce our guests. Dr. Ken Koshansky is the Senior Vice President for the Health Sciences and Dean of the Renaissance School of Medicine here at Stony Brook. Earlier in his career, Ken led groundbreaking hematology studies, which resulted in a better understanding of platelet and stem cell production disorders. He is a fellow of the National Academy of Medicine and of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And I'm very excited to have Ken talk about today what we're doing at Stony Brook to advance clinical research in the war against COVID-19. And he'll tell us, I'm sure, about the myriad clinical trials going on right now at University Hospital. Thanks for being with us here today, Ken. Our other guests, uh, Dr. Lilian Mujica Perotti is a professor of biomedical engineering here at the university. She's the director of the Laboratory for Computational Neurodiagnostics. In her work, Lily will be, uh, she'll share with us today about her work. She can tell us about how uh, crucial research in engineering driven medicine is uh, uh, facilitating our battle against COVID 19. And she'll tell us in particular about work she's done on the Aura Ring, the aim of which is to monitor the health, safety, and well being of frontline healthcare providers. Uh, this will be a really interesting part of our discussion. Uh, welcome, Lily. And finally, we have Dr. St Dr. Scott Weingart. Uh, Scott is a professor of uh, medicine. He's a critical care physician and attending physician at Stony Brook University Hospital. He's also the chief of the Division of Emergency Critical Care at the Renaissance School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Weingart is on the front line, literally, uh, in the epicenter of this pandemic here in New York. He's using an evidence-based approach to uncover best treatments for our patients under the most challenging of circumstances. I understand Scott uh, has a conflict that will prevent him from being part of our podcast for the entire hour today, so we're going to start with him in a moment so that we can hear from him before he has to go off uh, to his other commitments. We're really grateful to you for taking uh, what time you have today with us, Scott. Thank you all for being here. Uh, as I said, uh, let's start uh, with Dr. Weingart. Scott, um, looking back to early February, Scott, when the first case of COVID-19 was diagnosed at Stony Brook, uh, and fast forward to today, um, why don't you share with us how you and your team have had to adjust to this rapidly shifting clinical landscape? Absolutely. And thank you for having me and giving me an opportunity to talk about the maelstrom we've been in for these past few weeks. Uh, this is like nothing we've ever seen. And I'm sure on other episodes of this podcast, the same has been said. Uh, most things that come that are new in medicine are just slight changes from the things we've already seen. This was a paradigm shift. Uh, we were seeing patients with vital sign abnormalities uh, far below anything that would allow the patients to sustain life. And we were forced to adapt in real time to try to figure out how to take care of them. Early on in this, uh, we were told by major societies worldwide that if the patient's oxygen saturation, which is a measure of how much oxygen is being carried in their blood, was even slightly lower than normal on a small amount of oxygen, uh, we should put them on ventilators, on machines that help them to breathe. And at the beginning, that's what we were doing. What we rapidly discovered is if we continued down that road, we would quickly exhaust the capabilities of our hospital and basically all the hospitals along Long Island. So the major shift we've seen is trying to adapt to a clinical situation that we would ordinarily just 
respond in a way completely opposed to what we're doing now a few weeks into this situation. And now we're taking patients whose oxygen saturations we would never allow to continue at the levels they're at and trying to get them through without putting them on mechanical ventilators. And so that's, that's I think, been the biggest change, Michael. That's very interesting. Can you, can you, you've told us a bit about what you're now addressing in the emergency care unit. How many new patients are you seeing on a daily basis? How has that evolved over the past, say, 50 days? Yeah, this is the weird thing. And it's, it, it's, could be approached from two levels because there should have been the same number of patients with normal non-COVID diseases coming to the hospital with emergencies, right? You could imagine patients stay in their homes if they have elective problems or, or chronic complaints that they've been having for years. But if they were having emergencies like heart attacks or strokes, those should be happening at the same rate as before the COVID response. And that was our fear is all of a sudden, we're going to have the same number of patients with non-COVID complaints and all these new COVID patients. This enormous you know, deluge of patients uh, with, with COVID-related problems. And for whatever reason, the non-COVID emergencies went down radically. So uh, there were weeks that we were really overwhelmed, but that we were overwhelmed primarily with COVID patients. And the hospital's response to this was amazing. I mean, I've never... I. I Often I'm cynical about the capabilities of hospitals to adapt to new situations. Uh, this has not been the case in COVID at Stony Brook. They have been extraordinary with their nimbleness, with their agility to react. And so we got a handle on the COVID cases. We, we'd we open tents, we'd open new areas of the hospital, we'd open new ICUs. And so the COVID patients, we even during the surge, while there were times it was a little bit hairy, we're able to keep it under control, far better than most of the hospitals where my colleagues work at across New York City. But for whatever reason, and I still don't have a clear explanation for this, the non-COVID emergencies went down to a trickle, which was good. We couldn't handle both. And only now, only in the past few days, are we seeing the normal emergent complaints that would be filling to you know, the brim, our emergency department before COVID, only now are they starting to come in with any degree of regularity. Scott, do you think do you think some of that this issue of uh, the so called normal cases you would see in the in the critical care division, you think that reduction in volume is uh, sort of self selection by by a public that's paying attention to the declarations and the news coming from both from Stony Brook Medicine and from the Department of Health here in New York State, as well as the Centers for Disease Control? I'm sure there's a small part that could be attributed to that. But think about it. If you have appendicitis and your appendix is swollen to the point where you can't even move, much less you know go about your normal life, you don't have a choice. You're going to call an ambulance and come in. We have not seen the volume of those kind of emergencies. If your heart, you know, unfortunately, if your arteries obstruct in your coronaries and you have a heart attack, you can't wait it out. You can't say, I don't want to be at the hospital because I'm going to catch COVID. You have no choice. This is a disease state that would force you to come. And for whatever reason, the volume of those emergencies has gone down to a much smaller percentage than we saw before. Really fascinating. And just to return to your point about, about the hospital itself, I mean, this has been, you make the point about how skillfully and how effectively the hospital shifted shifted focus. This is something that's been widely remarked upon uh, in others of our podcasts. It's been remarked upon in the press. Uh, it's gotten national attention. We were just discussing that national attention earlier today in a, in a team meeting uh, in, in the administration building. Um, I have to say, I think a big part of it, and I'm, and I'm not just saying it uh, because of all of you on this call, but especially because all of you are on this podcast, uh, I think it's about leadership. I think, uh, you know, Ken Kashansky and his team, you know, Carol Gomes and her team in the hospital, you, Scott, and everyone in the uh, in the emergency uh, in the emergency division have just responded in in remarkable ways. Um, hindsight always being twenty twenty, as we say. <laughs> um, what, as you assess at the moment where you are, I know things will change uh, even more so in the weeks ahead, but from your vantage point today, uh, what would you think we should do differently knowing what we know today um, to address things like COVID-19 in the future from, from the vantage point of the critical care unit you lead? Yeah, well, it's funny. Yeah, because small question. 
<laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wish I knew today what I will know three months from now. That would be a much better situation. We don't understand the pathophysiology of this disease. Even now, even weeks into it, we still are merely responding to the symptomatology and we're trying to make the best of it predicated on our pre-existing knowledge of critical care and, and physiology. We do not understand what's going on. Something is very different about this disease than any disease we've seen before. Patients are not presenting the same way and therefore to respond with our existing paradigms, which is what we've done, up until now may be helpful and it may not. It may be exactly the wrong thing. We've noticed something and it's not just us. This is across the world. I have colleagues in Italy and China, all across New York City, and we're all noticing the same thing, which is when you put a patient on a ventilator, they get radically worse. And at first we just convinced ourselves it was selection. A patient sick enough to need a ventilator obviously is going to get even sicker because they had proven themselves to be sick in the first place. That is not what we're seeing. We're seeing the fact that going on to mechanical ventilation itself seems to radically accelerate the disease course. And that's different than any other disease we've dealt with. And as a result, we are really in a catch-22 of uh, Either we respond with our existing paradigms or we change the paradigm without enough evidence to be able to know we're right. And that's a horrible situation to be in for a clinician. What we always want to do is stick with the existing things we know have worked until we have absolute proof that a change is warranted. And I don't know if COVID-19 is going to lend itself to waiting. Interesting point you've made uh, about mechanical ventilation, just for the sake of our viewers and listeners. I mean, we do have some patients who are successfully ventilated, right? They ultimately come off the ventilators and they go home, correct? I've been surprised. Our rate has been better than most of the places in the country. We have an excellent uh, capability of taking patients who require mechanical ventilation and getting them off. Some, some places across the United States, 80, 90% mortality on a ventilator. We have not seen numbers like that. So we're doing well. But if we could keep them off the ventilator entirely, these patients do even better. Now, again, that might be selection. It might be the patients who we can't keep off are sicker, and therefore that's a part of it. But we are trying actively to not intubate patients for circumstances we absolutely would have done so before COVID-19. So uh, I, I know, Scott, you have to go in a moment. Two other quick questions before we let you go. Uh, these are these are more specific. One is I, I, I've heard something about, I, I don't know if I have this right, uh, a granular intubating monkey checklist. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what that is. What is that? <laughs> is it a monkey? I mean, it's not an animal, is it? What, what is it? <laughs> Obviously, this is tongue in cheek because I found for adult education, if you don't have a sense of humor, then people don't take up the information. But intubation is the act of putting a plastic tube down a patient's windpipe to help them breathe. And we've done this in emergency medicine and critical care and anesthesia as an everyday practice for decades. This is what we do. COVID-19, for the first time, uh, short of maybe a few cases with the Ebola scare, was the first time that not only did we have to worry about putting the tube in perfectly for the patient's benefit, we had to worry about the safety of the practitioners at a level we've never had to do before. And what we realized very soon after doing a few of these intubations is that in the past, the hardest part was getting that tube in perfectly on the first try, which we're pretty damn good at in all the specialties in Stony Brook. All of a sudden, now you had to be more concerned about not exposing you and your staff. And as a result, what we would do just by uh, absolute reflex, by heuristic response, now suddenly there was all these new facets to keep the team safe. And after doing a few, what we realized is the way to get this done is to have a nurse in the room that read off each step at such a granular level that you, as the actual practitioner, the person putting in the tube, all you had to do was listen to what they ordered you to do step by step to the point of like, put this here on the table at this location. Now pick up this item and put it in your hand. And as a result, all you had to do is listen to commands and then stick the tube into the right hole. And it took away all of the cognitive bandwidth that you have lost because you are now in a space helmet 
with a breathing system providing air and you can't hear what's being said and you have lost your existing normal reflex actions. So this insane granular intubating monkey checklist allowed you to just divorce your brain from the entire procedure. That's that's helpful. Thank you. One one final question. We'll let you go and we'll turn to uh, Lily and Ken. Um, you have a blog podcast of your own. Uh, it's called EM Crit. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about it? What made you decide to do it? How has it been received? And then, as I say, I promise we'll let you go. I know you have uh, another obligation. This has been a pleasure. Uh, so it's 13 years old, the MCRIP blog and podcast. I, I think, to my understanding, we are the most popular medical podcast worldwide. And the blog, since COVID, has received uh, probably one of the highest hit counts for COVID-19 information. Uh, what we seek to do is provide minute-by-minute minute updated evidence-based medicine for emergency medicine and critical care. Uh, and the reason we went independent is we want to be beholden to no companies, no manufacturers, no drug companies. And we want to be able to get information out there with an alacrity that's very difficult for major organizations like, you know, the um, – uh, professional organizations for emergency medicine and critical care, where it may be months before they get board approval. Uh, so to have an independent source for evidence-based medicine uh, has been enormously powerful. And the uptake by practitioners actually on the front lines has been amazing and so rewarding. And so uh, with COVID, it's just really proven itself because we could get the articles as they're published in preprint form out there to people on the front lines instantaneously. There's normally a 10-year uptake period between the publication of new evidence and the actual dissemination to the people on the front lines. And we've tried to break that barrier down to something like 10 minutes. That's magnificent. Uh, congratulations on the success of the podcast. Uh, here at uh, Beyond the Expected, we'll try to follow your great example and try to become a very uh, popular podcast ourselves. Thank you, Dr. Scott Weingard. Uh, uh, we know how busy you are, and we salute you and all of the team in the critical care division at Stony Brook Hospital for all your great work on behalf of our communities uh, and on behalf of our patients. Thanks so much. Um, Thank, uh, uh, let me now uh, uh, draw in uh, Ken Kashansky, and then uh, in a moment we'll also bring in uh, Dr. Muhika Parodi. Uh, Ken, let me, let me start with you uh, here as we resume our conversation. Uh, uh, tell our listeners and viewers a little bit about the clinical trials and the research posture now being taken by Stony Brook Medicine as we confront the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, Michael. Uh, first, perhaps a discussion, a brief discussion of why do clinical trials? Uh, medicine has a rich history. Why don't we just uh, take our solutions off the shelf and apply them to uh, COVID-19? Well, the answer is we have seen nothing like COVID-19 before. And so we don't have a lot of evidence on which to base our clinical decision making and our therapeutics. Number two, although there are some suggestions that this drug might work or that intervention might work, we just don't know. And if we just start guessing, working on hunches, uh, then we will not be in a position to provide the very best care to our patients. And so clinical trials are the mechanism by which we study carefully and robustly study any sort of new diagnostic, any sort of new prognostication, and especially any new therapeutic that might be useful for a patient with COVID-19. And so the clinical trials that are underway in the United States are numerous. And we have the good fortune of having about eight clinical trials here at Stony Brook University. Uh, several with so a drug that you may have heard about, hydroxychloroquine, this is a drug that was uh, made popularized uh, in, a, um, in a broadcast uh, by President Trump uh, when he surmised that it might be effective. So let's test it rigorously. Let's not just play a Trump that it might, uh, a hunch that it might work. Uh, let's test it vigorously. So we have two trials of hydroxychloroquine in patients uh, here at Stony Brook. One 
is can it be used to protect healthcare workers against acquiring the infection? We have a large number of people here at Stony Brook who are on the front lines, people in the intensive care units, people in the emergency departments who are seeing patients firsthand uh, with potential COVID-19 disease. So can the use of these drugs prevent them from getting infected? Uh, another round is to test out whether it's effective or not in patients with mild or moderate disease. Uh, COVID-19. So we're doing those kind of studies presently. Uh, there's a big question in COVID-19, which is worse, the virus causing the problem or is the inflammation that the virus evokes worse for the patient? Uh, on the side of the inflammation, we're testing out a drug that has been used in patients with widespread inflammation uh, there is a molecule, a cytokine called interleukin-6, which is responsible for a lot of inflammation in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, with ulcerative colitis, with a number of diseases. Can suppressing IL-6 help out patients with moderate or severe COVID-19? On the other side is the virus. Are there drugs that might be available that could treat the viral infection and there's a drug called remdesivir. This is a drug that was created to attack the Ebola virus. Uh, and there are certain similarities. Um, it's a RNA virus. So perhaps that drug might be useful in patients with COVID-19. And so we are part of a large national clinical trial testing out remdesivir for those patients. Now, for 130 years, people have been using plasma or serum, that is people who are immune to an infection using their serum or their plasma to treat new patients who have that infection. And we have a randomized clinical trial testing out recovered patients, people who have recovered from COVID-19 and we're collecting their plasma, we're collecting their plasma to give to patients with COVID-19. Now, some institutions are just giving it out. They're just, uh, well, I'm sure it probably works, so let's just give it. I don't believe that, and neither do my colleagues here at Stony Brook. We need to study it because giving plasma is not uh, completely benign. There are some side effects. And so we believe that we need to prove that that kind of treatment works. And so we have steadfastly stuck to a clinical trial protocol of plasma in these patients. And perhaps the most innovative clinical trial, if you will, that we're uh, attempting here at Stony Brook, participating in a national clinical trial, you're gonna hear about uh, from Dr. Mohika Prodi, uh, an engineering device that will give us insights into when and how and what happens when a healthcare worker comes across that virus. So, uh, Ken, thank you. We'll, we'll turn to Lily in one second here. Let me just ask you to frame what you've just said uh, with reference to one other question. Do you have a sense of where clinical research in the United States is relative to, quote unquote, the rest of the world? Are we ahead, behind, in the same place, or is that impossible to tell? So we are always in touch with the literature, and the literature, because of our digital age, is always coming out. This morning, I was alerted to a paper on hydroxychloroquine and the initial results of a large uh, Veterans Administration study of hydroxychloroquine. Uh, the study was negative, although it was not the most robust of study designs. We are studying it prospectively. That was a retrospective study. But to your question, Michael, where are we? Where is the country? Uh, again, just today, I was made aware of a paper published by the uh, scientists at the University of Texas Southwestern, a very fine medical school and hospital. And they reviewed every paper dealing with therapeutic trials for COVID-19. And their conclusions are there are seven of the most promising drugs uh, that are being tested right now in patients with COVID-19. And we are actually testing five of those seven drugs here at Stony Brook. And so I think that there is a 
widespread effort to look at clinical trials for new drugs, new diagnostics in COVID-19 disease. Uh, we are part of the forefront of those studies, and I remain optimistic that by studying these drugs carefully, we will be able to add to our evidence base for best decisions for our patients with COVID-19. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Dr. Lilian Mojica Perotti, uh, uh, Ken mentioned uh, the important work you're doing in the interface between engineering and medicine on COVID-19. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that work. I know you have a, a, a special relationship, if we can say that, to this disease. So you can uh, tell us how you came to start focusing on COVID-19. Thank you very much. Uh, so at, we're actually really just at the very beginning stages of launching a study in this area. But um, as often happens, we were sort of positioned ideally to address this particular question because my lab had been working on related questions in personalized medicine for several decades prior. Um, the, the, what I'm really most passionate about is the question of whether we can predict um, clinical trajectories of diseases. And what I mean by clinical trajectories is uh, the progression of a disease. So we all know that there are some diseases that start very insidiously. So in the case of dementia, for example, there are individuals who notice, you know, in their 50s, 60s, that they're having some, what they might call senior moments. And then as they get older, those might progress into what eventually might meet diagnostic criteria. And then there are diseases uh, like schizophrenia, um, or at least one type of schizophrenia where Someone might seem perfectly fine growing up as a child and then um, have some stressor at 18 and have a, a psychotic break and very rapidly become uh, very ill very quickly. And what we're interested in here is, um, in the context of, of COVID-19, is understanding uh, the clinical trajectory, um, not just of the disease as a whole, but specifically why different individuals seem to be responding so differently. So uh, I think you know one of the most striking features of this particular uh, illness is that there are some individuals who are infected and are completely asymptomatic. They might be transmitting it, but they themselves don't actually show any symptoms. And then there are individuals who feel sick or even quite sick, but don't require hospitalization. And then there are individuals who die. And initially, I think the assumption was that there might be some predisposing risk factors or that age might be the issue. And to a certain degree, that's true, but it really doesn't tell the whole picture. There's quite a bit of individual variability, even among very similar cohorts in terms of how they respond. And so um, what we are trying to understand is if we can start to look at the behavior of the immune system, and its dynamics as a way to predict what the disease course might look like. And so the rationale behind it is that, um, as Ken mentioned, it's really not as simple as, you know, you become infected and does your immune system recognize it, pick it up and fight it. So there are some people who might not have a strong enough immune system to respond but in many cases, it's not lack of an immune response that kills people. It's actually an immune response that is so strong that it goes into overdrive. And that's very similar to other types of diseases as well. Um, it's, our, our physiology is, is fine-tuned in such a way that um, most of the variables that, that are of interest actually need to be maintained within very tight boundaries. So for example, um, you know, if your glucose levels, your blood sugar is too low, um, you're very sick. If your blood sugar is too high, you're also very sick. Same thing with sodium, same thing with almost every other measure in the body. And so the way the body regulates um, all of these measures being exactly within the tight requirements of what the body requires is that there are some mechanisms that kind of push a response up and there are other measures in the body that sort of a mechanism that pushes the response down. And in a healthy autonomic nervous system, in a healthy endocrine system, 
in a healthy neural system, in a healthy immune system, there's a balance between this push-pull of what is pushing something up and what is um, pushing something down. Now that leads to a kind of a dynamic in terms of the variables that you measure. So when we're looking at the brain, we're looking at um, how the brain is responding to uh, different inputs. And we're looking at the dynamics of that brain response as clue, uh, a clue as to how the neural circuits are balanced between those excitatory and inhibitory components. In the case of the autonomic nervous system, it's a very similar situation where you again you have a circuit and you have to infer the health of the circuit or if it's not healthy, the dysregulation and then understanding what exactly mechanistically is wrong with the circuit simply by going by the dynamics. Now, um, one of the problems with, with medicine as it currently stands is that most measurements are made in contexts where it's not possible to take a continuous measurement. So for example, if you want to go and see if you have uh, diabetes or even if you're insulin resistant, um, you know, you take a bolus of glucose and then you, you know, you have a blood measurement before and then two hours later you have another blood measurement. But in fact, if you really want to measure something accurately in terms of its dysregulation, if you're really interested in, in the circuit and how it's behaving, you need to actually look at the dynamics. And in order to see dynamics, in order to see how something is changing over time, um, you need to take a very particular type of measurement that won't be captured, for example, by taking blood pressure once in a doctor's office, uh, once a year, or even every six months, or even once a month. Um, and likewise, you know, taking your blood sugar um, every now and then. It really needs to be taken continuously. And so there's a whole um, evolution in terms of engineering-driven medicine towards being able to even capture those variables of interest in a dynamic, continuous way. So there are um, continuous ambul ambulatory glucometers that measure glucose over long periods of time. And in this case, what we want to do is to be able to look at the immune system over time so we can see how it's changing over time. So Lily, this is a, this, I sense that you're, this has to do with your so-called aura ring project. Is that correct? Yeah. So, uh, you know, maybe you could the, tell our listeners and viewers about that. So in the last, you know, 20 years or so, people have gradually moved towards adopting, even in just ordinary consumers have been looking at, um, at wearables. So what's known as the quantified self. Um, so I'm wearing two devices right now. This is the Whoop. This is the Aura Ring. Um, and these are actually um, biosensors. They're picking up on various measurements ranging from heart rate, respiration, movement. Um, this can be used to calculate uh, sleep performance. Uh, in the case of the Aura Ring, it's measuring continuously temperature. And what that affords is the ability to then have the data really for the first time to ask how the disease progression is occurring, not on a daily basis or on a weekly basis, but really on a minute to minute basis. Um, and so one of, the, one of the clues that we have that might be uh, predictive of, of why some people are recovering very quickly from COVID-19 and other people are degenerating very quickly. And also bear in mind that there's a dynamic in which people go through um, recovery and relapse behavior. So they think they're perfectly fine and then they have a severe uh, relapse and then they get better and then they have another relapse and so forth. Um, one of the clues may be found actually in, for example, temperature fluctuations or um, heart rate fluctuations because um, what that might be reflecting is actually the immune system balancing sort of an attack retreat type of behavior um, that in an optimal immune response is balanced so that the system is able to activate enough to actually fight the infection, but doesn't get into a kind of an overdrive positive feedback loop where it can't turn off and then the system exhausts itself. Um, and so what we're thinking is that the oscillations that we see in the temperature 
might tell us something about the behavior of the immune system and how it with the strategy essentially that it's using in attacking the infection and whether that strategy tells us something about the trajectory for um, how people recover. And uh, Lily, one more question, then I, I want to uh, turn to both of you on a broader questions about the research initiative. You use the phrase personalized medicine uh, for, our, for our viewers and listeners. Uh, maybe you could explain what that means and how that frames this work that that you're doing, you in your lab are doing with respect to COVID-19 and, and more broadly in engineering-driven medicine? When, in fact, you are dealing with averages, you're dealing with um, data that is averaged over large groups of people, then you have outcomes that are averaged over large groups of people. When you want to make individual predictions and assessments of how an individual will respond over time, you need to depend much more heavily on that own individual's data sets. Um, so typically what happens is that um, in medicine, you need very large um, numbers of subjects in order to have enough data to reach statistical significance, to have results that seem robust. Um, and for that reason, taking one single person's data isn't sufficient to tell you anything really important about how that person will progress over time. But with the approach that I just described, where you're actually measuring the same individual over long periods of time, you're solving that problem by collecting a lot of data on one person and then using that data to then make predictions about how that person will evolve over time. So how are we testing this? In this case, um, we're taking um, 250 frontline healthcare providers at Stony Brook Hospital. Um, who are in the emergency department and the ICU. And we're making available, um, again, this, this Aura Ring. The reason why we're working specifically with this company is because um, they include temperature, which is, in this case, a very key variable. Um, and the, these individuals um, will be wearing this, and then we will be able to sort of track all of these variables over time. And because we also... Um, they've given us access to their um, electronic medical records. We also have information that is validated, so it's not by self-report, um, based on their pre-existing conditions. So, for example, how is this affected by autoimmune disorders? So if someone has autoimmune disease, does that change the strategy that their immune system uses to fight an infection? And exactly, you know, how is, is that improving the strategy? Is it, is it worsening it or is it just a more, is, is it adaptive to that particular situation? This allows us to objectively um, kind of to Ken's point, use the data to really answer these questions rather than going by hunches or what seems what like it might be reasonable, but really um, answering these questions in a much more rigorous way. Um, and then for those individuals who unfortunately do become infected, because we have their electronic medical records, we'll know um, were they hospitalized, um, what treatment did they receive, um, how often did they receive treatment, when were they discharged, and then this will tell us something about the trajectory for how the disease developed, um, which will allow us then to kind of refine these algorithms and determine if these dynamics of the variables that we're measuring over long periods of time, which might be up to a year, um, can predict how vulnerable the individual is to, uh, to becoming infected, and once infected, whether we can predict the individual variability in terms of how they respond. And that approach is, um, is personalized medicine. That's, that's very helpful, Lily. Thank you. Ken, Ken, back to you. You've been a leading advocate uh, for quite a while. <laughs> You've been a leading advocate for so-called bench-to-bedside research strategies, you know, closing that gap between work going on at the laboratory bench where basic research is going on and then moving to the clinical arena where patients are, are being treated uh, by healthcare providers. Uh, tell us about how this particular challenge, closing that gap, is, is being met in Stony Brook Medicine and uh, in particular with reference to the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, Michael. And thank you for not mentioning for how long I have been an advocate for bench to bedside or even uh, bedside to bench to bedside research. And perhaps I can illustrate what's going on in Stony Brook Medicine with an example. Uh, a very astute uh, surgical ICU physician of ours, Jerry Rubano and his colleagues began noticing 
that one of the engineered devices that we use very frequently in the intensive care unit and are really all through the hospital, what's called a pulse oximeter. It measures theoretically how much oxygen is in your blood, how much is on your hemoglobin. And it's a very easy device. You put it on your finger and uh, it measures the amount uh, of the hemoglobin that's saturated with oxygen. But people began to wonder if that's an accurate measure uh, in patients with COVID-19. And Jerry took about 50 consecutive patients in the intensive care unit and actually measured the pulse oximeter readings against the actual gold standard of measuring oxygen in the blood and found that in a large number of the patients with COVID-19, there was a discrepancy. So that's the bedside part. Now, where's the bench come in? Well, it's important to know how and why and how come that observation was made. Does it give us insights into what's going on in patients with COVID-19? And so now in collaboration with members of the Department of Chemistry, uh, in the Division of Hematology, and a number of other people all through Stony Brook University, we've launched an effort to try to understand this discrepancy. The discrepancy is important. The warning goes out, don't believe the pulse oximeter all the time. Uh, it may give you a false reading. Check the gold standard more frequently so you know exactly how you're treating patients. And in fact, Jerry submitted a paper uh, for publication just last night uh, with this observation. Now, once we have, once we're armed with the explanation as to why this happens, this is a property of the virus. Is a viral protein causing this uh, misdiagnosis, this uh, fooling of the pulse oximeter. Once we have that in hand, it may give us great insights into the disease and it might give us a handle on a better way to diagnose, prognosticate or treat the disease. So in COVID-19, there are ample such examples of disconnects. Uh, why are the patients with COVID-19 developing blood clots? Uh, that has been noticed at Stony Brook. It's been noticed all through the country. Another, um, uh, uh, an article appeared in the, in the popular press uh, just uh, this morning about why are patients with COVID-19 so susceptible to blood clotting. Over the years, we have found a number of genetic and other reasons for people to clot excessively. Uh, patients who are perfectly healthy develop blood clots. Um, so, is that information useful in helping us understand what's going on in COVID-19 and importantly, prevent blood clots? And we've already begun to adopt our standard way of treating patients with COVID-19 with that observation in mind. We're much quicker to anticoagulate patients to prevent them from developing blood clots now than we would otherwise standard patients who are equally sick with uh, other diseases. So clinical observations, research into what is causing those clinical observations, and then acting upon that research to better care for our patients. Uh, I gave you just two examples, but there's probably another dozen examples that we believe we can sort out by, as Lily says, looking at scads and scads of data and by using the important combination of clinicians and researchers who are working side by side as we do here at Stony Brook Medicine. We have a couple of minutes left, so let me, uh, uh, let me ask both of you. We, uh, in this series of podcasts where we focused on the coronavirus pandemic, uh, uh, we've, we've always tried to close in asking our guests to sort of uh, try and be prognosticators as best as possible. I mean, from, both of you, from your vantage point, thinking about the research uh, and the clinical, you know, engagement with this with this disease. Um, what do you see in terms of timeline? What would you like to share with our audience today about what they can anticipate uh, and hope for in the weeks and months ahead? Why don't we start with you, Lily, and then we'll we'll turn it to Ken to close. I think actually my own perspective is that it would be irresponsible of me to try to anticipate how this will play out simply because we don't have the information. Um, and I think it's it's actually 
um, very, very problematic to raise expectations in any particular direction, but rather from my own perspective, again, I think what is most rational is to anticipate multiple scenarios and to prepare ourselves to mitigate the consequences in all of those scenarios. Thanks, Lily. Uh, that, that is a very important uh, caveat that we always have to keep in mind. Uh, looking at our data at University Hospital day after day after day, uh, I do know, uh, as you've read in the popular press, that the first wave, and the reason I say first wave will become apparent in a moment, but this first wave of this pandemic as it's hit Long Island is on the uh, downslope. At Stony Brook University Hospital, our census of uh, COVID-19 patients is coming down nicely. It's about 20, 25% lower than it was 10 days ago. And the number of patients admitted to the hospital every day is lower than the day prior. We're discharging a large number of patients and we are seeing a large number of patients survive this terrible disease. Um, but we don't know what the future holds because we don't know what fraction of the population in Suffolk County has been exposed to the virus. If 60, 70, 80% of the population has been exposed to COVID-19 and they've developed antibodies and are now immune to the disease, whether they felt bad or not, the future looked pretty good actually. But if only five or 10 or 15%, which is what I think is probably happening of the citizens of the residents of Suffolk County has been exposed to this disease and are now immune to it. I think we are gonna see wave two and wave three into the future until and unless we get an effective and safe vaccine that will make everybody immune to this disease. So just as Lily said, we need to prepare for all sorts of scenarios. We need to keep our six feet social distancing. We need to keep our masks on. We need to keep washing our hands and making sure that we don't uh, touch our face all the time um, because this disease is not gonna go away uh, next week or next month, hopefully in a year, year and a half when we have vaccines, if we have vaccines, we'll be in a better position to prognosticate uh, that COVID-19 is in our rear view mirror. It's not in our rear view mirror yet. Well, thank you both for those uh, important insights. I want to thank our guests, uh, Dr. Lilian Mohika Parodi and Dr. Ken Kashansky. Thank our viewers and listeners uh, for joining us on Beyond the Expected. Be safe, be well. We'll see you and speak with you next time. Thanks so much. Uh -huh.